WSJ. Welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. S.J. Stone Go, Gary Fife, Daho Jeff Giddos, Muskogee Radio, Mabu Hedget, Wedgkis. Welcome to our program here on a gray, overcast, oak moldy morning. We've uh, got a couple things we'll be sharing uh, uh, with you. It's uh, uh, a couple of staff people from the Center for Victim Services about a special observance they have this month. And later we had scheduled uh, a chance to chat with uh, Stan Jodio. Um, Muskogee rapper, but uh, you know, as live radio goes, sometimes it doesn't quite work out. But we do have some material from the uh, college uh, about a new educational language program they have, so we've got stuff to play today. Uh, first of all, let me welcome in, into our studio uh, uh, Morgan James, who is the health and wellness coordinator, and Michaela Audubo, the outreach coordinator for that program. Uh, welcome to our show. Uh, thank you for coming in today. We appreciate you making time for us. Thank you for having us. Okay. Well, uh, as I always like to start uh, any discussion, let's find out who you work for and what your mission is. Either one of you? Sign language? <laughs> uh, I'm Morgan James. I'm the health and wellness coordinator. I provide support groups for women that have been in domestic violence situations or sexual assault situations. So we just offer um, monthly or weekly groups for those women to attend. We have them in various locations. We have them in Muskogee, Omogee, Wetumpka, and Eufaula. Um, and I also make sure that our staff are taken care of as well, making sure they're practicing self-care um, because the work that we do is really, um, it's hard. It's hard work, and the stuff that we hear every day is hard, and it takes a toll on our advocates, so I just make sure that they're taking care of themselves as well. Okay, and Michaela, you're, you're part of the program. Yeah, so I am the outreach coordinator for our program, and my job, I am the one that goes out into the community and spreads the awareness on different subjects that we deal with in our program, as well as provide information about what our services include and how we can help victims. Okay, now you all have a uh, special observance this month, is that correct? Yes, that's actually today. So today is Denim Day, and I can give a little bit of a back history on what Denim Day is and how that came to be. Um, so typically, Denim Day is every fourth Wednesday of April, and in 1999, the Italian Supreme Court overturned a rape conviction in which an 18-year-old student in Italy was raped by her 45-year-old driving instructor during a driving lesson in 1992. Um, they ruled this because she was wearing tight jeans and there must have been consent. And so due to this ruling, in an act of solidarity, women lawmakers wore jeans to work in protest in the steps of the Italian Supreme Court. And soon this solidarity spread around the world. So now we have Denim Day. And so the purpose of Denim Day is to wear jeans with a purpose, and that purpose is to support survivors and victims and educate ourselves and others about sexual violence. Now, is this uh, pretty well observed? Are you aware of uh, people reacting and supporting? Yes, this is actually nationally recognized. Okay. Any thoughts there, uh, Morgan? Um, yeah, so just the stigma around it as well. I'm um, just saying that the type of clothing that mm -hmm. these women are wearing are... Um, consensual. Just, yeah, yeah, just trying to make it consensual when it's not. I mean, a woman can wear... I mean, they're wearing swimsuits and nobody... They're not giving consent for that. Right. So why would it be wearing tight jeans would be can give consent? Uh, just to let our studio, I mean, our audience know, we have two Morgans in here today. <laughs> yes, my name's Morgan as well. So. Uh, yeah. Morgan Taylor, our colleague here, has come set in on the studio. Yeah, uh, in, uh, in on our discussion here. Now, as we um, have been uh, aware of uh, uh, growing support for uh, for women's programs and fights against violence, uh, 
Have you all seen some evidence of that here within uh, the Creek Nation or even uh, Mulgee or Oklahoma? Either one of you there. Yeah, I know that there's a just a great deal of organizations that support the violence behind women, and um, one of those support groups is actually the MMIW chapter that's located here. And so I know that they do a lot of outreach and they host a lot of fundraisers to really advocate for that um, violence against women. Now, MMIW is? Uh, missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Right. Now, that's a pretty well a, a national movement. We've heard uh, those initials pop up uh, with, in connection with several national organizations and uh, observances on different uh, uh, reservations and, and uh, urban groups around the nation. Now, is um, uh, the Muscogee Nation itself uh, 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 an integral part of it? I know your being here is, is representative of that, but uh, Morgan, do you think uh, the tribe's really uh, uh, pitching in here? Um, I believe so. Um, I know Teresa Wisner, she, um, she does really a lot of work for the MMIW. Um, she's going to be speaking at our event on the 5th um, to give a little more information about it. So I think that's good as well. Mm -hmm. I think, um, like, recently I just did a, a story about sexual assault just for the month and everything. And I think I, I really came across some interesting statistics. Um, you know, the MMIW thing. Um, that's like they say it's more of a public health issue so like when you think about it it's like COVID like it's like on that same level where they're mm -hmm. like this is an issue in, nationally and it's um, something that the public should be aware of and that's pretty sad that like you know they they relate it to something as as big as COVID mm -hmm. you know and that we go like Native American women go have more of a chance to be sexually assaulted at twice the rate of anybody else mm -hmm. well in that uh, research you've done and, and material you've uncovered uh, that uh, I think for me it, it requires some explanation like I, I think of an assault on women as a crime right yeah you know, right. and human uh, a crime against humanity but how does it fit under health I mean have, has there uh, been any discussion there well I think the health part of it is just like the um, the reason why they say it's a public health issue is because of just the need for it to be known to the public and like the need to spread the information and so as to why why it happens more to Native American women if you see a um, any other ethnicity of woman and a native her Native American friend the Native American friend is twice as more likely to get you know um, assaulted or abused or anything like that and I think I don't know I can say personally that it does take a toll on your mental health, you know what I mean, to be in those situations, and it affects you in every aspect of your life, you know, <clears throat> to be a mom or to be an employee or to be, you know, a daughter or a friend, like, it takes a toll on you in your relationships. Mm -hmm. you do, know? You, do you two uh, agree with that uh, definition as a health issue there? Yes, absolutely. I do agree with that because it's become such an issue now to where we really need to take action against it and spread that awareness in our communities because we're it's not only the families that are impacted, but also the reservations and also the tribal communities. And so being able to go out and spread that awareness and share those statistics, I think, is just something that we need to do as a community. Any thoughts, Morgan? Yes, I agree with Michaela. Yeah, with both of them. Yeah. Now, I, <clears throat> when I was working in uh, Alaska, I had, uh, uh, kind of overheard a couple guys sitting around in some restaurant or something like that. And uh, their approach to this idea was, you know, go out and have a good time, you know, pick up somebody and have, have fun can't get a regular girl, you can always get a native woman. You know, that made me furious at the moment, but I figured that's probably not the time to get in a fight, you know. So, uh, when you hear something like that, I mean, how does that strike you? Anyone there? I mean, it's alarming. I mean, for me, I am full Native American. And so for me, it's a bigger con safety concern whenever I'm out and about just shopping, like Walmart, 
going to the gas station, you have to be aware of your surroundings because there's people out there that are looking for you, your ethnicity, all of that comes into play. Um, and just making sure that my surroundings, I'm safe. And then you don't really realize, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have my own car, to be able to be able to transport myself to different places. And there's a lot of women that don't have that. So a lot of the times these cases, um, women are hitchhiking. And so they're getting picked up off of the highways and taken and then never seen again. And so that's something that we also want to be able to talk about and spread awareness for too. Okay. Any uh, thoughts from the other? You know, Morgan or Morgan? <laughs> I know for me that kind of ticks me off if somebody were to, you know, if I had to overhear that and um, I would probably try to flee the area, you know, and but what not every native woman's gonna have the same reaction to you know hearing that and maybe um, they might try to stand up for themselves and then get in another situation you know and and it's just sad like to know that there's so much like the Gabby Petito case like she was a little you know white girl and everybody the whole country blew up over her and then there's like the Brittany Tiger case that people don't even know about you mm -hmm. know and so when when we go through like just different things and people see that then they know that we're automatically targeted you know they know that we're not going to be heard our case isn't going to be heard nobody's nobody's going to care quote unquote you know so there's that i feel there's that part of it i feel like that's a reason why we are still targeted yeah i think it's heartbreaking just hearing those sorts of things as well um and i'm thinking just me, I'm one of those people that will say something like, hey, I heard, overheard what you said. I don't think that's okay um, because these are people. These are actual human beings that somebody cares about. It's somebody's mom. It's somebody's sister. It's somebody's aunt. Like these these women have lives, and they just make it seem like they're just they're just nothing. Objects. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, worse than nothing, actually. Yeah. I talk, yeah. You know, as, uh, as uh, we've... Uh, um, discuss the subject and, and try to focus and put a spotlight on it. I think uh, it's, it's wonderful that the tribe has reacted the way, the way it has and put this much energy. Now, um, what does the tribe have lined up to uh, make this observance happen? So our program, Besides Denim Day. <laughs> yeah, so our program, we're actually hosting a MMIP <laughs> honor walk, which is Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples. Um, and we're going to be hosting that walk on May 5th at two, from 2 to 3 um, at the Mound Building at the main Muscogee Creek Nation complex. And we will have t-shirts while our supplies last, but we highly encourage the community. Um, this is a community event, so all are welcome. There's no registration required. Um, we encourage you to come out and join us as we honor, remember, and raise awareness for our missing and murdered indigenous people. Okay, uh, I've seen a lot of um, different topics being addressed with, with a walk. And sometimes I wonder if uh, these kinds of things are effective. So, you know, why put the energy and, and the time into something like that? I mean, how does it, what are you trying to achieve there? How does that happen, I think? I think we're just trying to spread that awareness because a lot of people just in our community may not even know what MMIP means or stands for. So them just seeing our flyer um, and participating in that event and just hearing and reading st statistics that we have around, hopefully we'll bring that awareness and um, just spark a conversation throughout our community. Now, um, Morgan, you said earlier that uh, you, one of the things you focus on is the um, health and wellness of the staff. Uh, people have to deal with these subjects all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you sort of kind of alluded that it sometimes gets to you. I mean, you know, you, you, I have to sit sit back and watch and think, you know, gosh, how these people, you know, deal with these subjects all the time and maintain sanity or, uh, or something like that. So what do you try to do in, uh, in terms of uh, supporting staff who have to deal with these problems? Yeah, so um, I have a little section in our office just full of coloring sheets, um, 
like putty, essential oils, fingernail polish, uh, little board games, just something for our staff to step away just for a second if they need to, um, just from those tough situations if they're coming back from a saying exam and they just need a minute to themselves, um, we allow them that time um, and just give them that safe space if they need it. Um, but we, we try to do the best that we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, Michaela, you are the one who uh, is trying to make the program work and in terms of connecting with victims. Um, that's got to be a, a price to pay. There has to be a cost for you mentally or emotionally or even physically. I mean, how does it affect you? Yeah, I mean, whenever I'm out in the community talking to a lot of people at just different events, you can have people come up that want to tell you their story. And so, I see myself taking a lot of that secondary trauma home with me. And so something that I, I know she won't say it, but I love to commend Morgan for the work that she does for our office and with our self care and everything like that to really make sure that staff are taking care of themselves. And so whether it be just a coloring sheet, taking 15 minutes to sit and just kind of regroup to get back to where you were before said event. And so really just taking part in that self-care and putting yourself first um, after work hours as well is something that I found to be beneficial for me to kind of sit back and have, of course, I'm very lucky to have the support system that I do at home. And so having support system from my family and everything like that really just keeps me going and wanting to do the work that I do. Okay, uh, we'll talk with now with our other Morgan here. Now you're a reporter that has to deal with these subjects a lot and covering them and asking people to share uh, sometimes intimate stories or feelings um how does it strike you i mean is there a cost there for you to 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 deal with this um for me i think i'm more like i wear my heart on my sleeve so like if somebody's telling me a story i try not to like it let it invoke emotion in me at that moment but sometimes it does you know and sometimes hearing these things And feeling their victim victimization and like their pain and um, one of the first things I try to do is you know connect them with any services they may need or you know try to usually when they're telling their stories because they're ready mm-hmm. I feel like you know but um, yeah it can be a lot it can be a lot um, sometimes you think that you've heard it all you know and then you hear some more mm-hmm. and then it's just it can be really gruesome some of the things that people live with you know and the memories that they have of it but I think that's why this like the walks are important it's like not only you know for the awareness but like show your face so that next time or one time if you're not there people know to look for you you know how is the uh, problem being dealt with here with our tribe I mean uh, are we uh, uh, doing well is there a huge problem out there that isn't being addressed or there are people who are in hiding even or uh, is it uh, a more uh, positive uh, change shift in thinking in our population so, so how how's the tribe doing in, in addressing these problems and like i think that you know some trauma as far as being native american we ignore it mm-hmm. you know so like i think that's a pretty good question that you asked there like how, how many people actually seek services even if it's been years later you know mm-hmm Yeah, I know with me, um, since I do a lot of outreach, I think that I personally have seen a lot of the community coming together to address these issues and really just taking part to learn more about our services and making sure that they have our phone number and just telling us like, hey, I have a family member or a friend, I love to refer them to you. And of course, we do encourage the victims to call our program, but just easily as just passing along our phone number has just been extremely beneficial. Um, We've seen more calls come into our office. We're providing more services. Of course, there's small battles that we have to deal with every day. But overall, I have seen that the community overall has came together to address these situations. Mm, That's wonderful. Yeah, and I think not only the community, as I'll just talk off what she was saying, not only the community, but um, law enforcement, um, the AG's office, and tribal court as well, um, I think all of them are, I think they're taking a stand and doing what they can as well. Well, you yeah. raised an interesting point there. Um, there has been some criticism in the past that uh, 
law enforcement agencies, uh, particularly outside our tribe, had not taken the problem quite as seriously as, as, as it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, either ignoring or they're just natives or they're, you know, whatever, uh, drunks or runaways or yeah. stuff like that. And uh, perhaps the court system doesn't process their, uh, their cases, their situations to the full point of uh, taking action. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like then that uh, there has been some changes that have been, been made, uh, things that you can see or success stories perhaps that you could uh, point to in dealing with the, the judicial system? Um, yeah, here recently we just had a um, perp that was sentenced to three years, so I think that's a success. Um, of course, we're still having our challenges, but just... Um, noticing and recognizing those small wins as well and not just the downfalls that we're seeing so we're trying to focus on those but yes we're still having challenges and still trying to overcome those but um we see it mm -hmm. we can see the change i feel like it's such a heavy topic and it's just like case by case it, you yeah, know it's it very is. situational um i just i think that oh, well i had a question do you guys respond to any emergency type situations yeah, so we do have an on-call advocate 24-7. Um, so if a DV incident does occur, law enforcement, they have to call us because um, they have to complete an, a lethality form. So they'll give us a call, and then we'll take down that information. So we'll just... We'll just talk to the, um, to the victim if they want to speak with us. It's completely voluntary. Um, so we'll just give them a brief rundown about our program and to see if they have a safe place to go that night. Um, if they don't, we'll try to figure out some sort of um, shelter or if they can call a friend or a family member to see if they can come stay for the night. Um, but, yeah. Being in those situations can be kind of... I don't know, overwhelming, overstimulating, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you just can't think. So it's good to have that kind of like person there that you can, that I can help you call and run down all the list. You yeah. Know? So um, what are some of the things that you guys provide for a victim in particularly? Yeah. So some of the services that we offer are assistance in locating emergency shelter, as well as assistance with filing a protective order. Um, our advocates are also able to accompany the victims to court hearings, whether that be tribal, federal, or state. Um, we also assist in completing victim compensation claims, as well as creating safety plans with the victims. Um, we also have a child sexual assault advocate on staff, and we also have sexual assault nurse examiners who do our SANE exams, as well as our domestic violence exams. And then we also have our support, um, support groups that Morgan hosts as well. And then we offer counseling services too, and we also have an attorney. So if they're needing help with a divorce or custody or the protective order, we can assist with that as well. Like, what do I do? Do I call the cops? Do I get a lawyer? Mm -hmm. do I, um, this, I guess, next question uh, might seem a bit more personal. Have either of you uh, ever been uh, working with a victim on the phone, which uh, was what I would call an emergency situation when their life might be in, in danger or the life of their kids or something like that. I mean, has it gone that far? And without revealing any names, of course. Well, I personally haven't had um, any cases like that just because I am the outreach coordinator, so I don't have, um, I don't have the contact with the victims mm -hmm. like our advocates would. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say not maybe like after the fact, maybe when they're still in that high state, perp maybe just left or they're just leaving that situation and they're just on high alert um, because of the incident um, and just trying to not really calm them down, but get them to a state where they're able to talk, where they're able to get in a safe space and um, just to make sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that high alert, like, feeling or emotion is, like, <clears throat> very traumatizing, you mm -hmm. know? It's, it's very bad for your mental health and emotional and psychological, you know? It makes you, it's that fight or flight, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. So it's, it can be, um, I'm sure dealing with it is pretty 
rough sometimes trying to get them to calm down. Yeah. But y'all are calm. Y'all are like super calm. You're making me feel calm. <laughs> <laughs> like you have to Very have a calm. Zen. Very zen. Yes, I love it. You have to have like a calm kind of, you know, be a calm person, I guess. Yeah. If someone was interested in uh, being a part of your staff or um, dealing with these uh, problems on a professional basis, uh, uh, what kind of uh, characteristics or attributes should a person have when they approach uh, uh, a profession, shall we say, uh, an employment uh, dedication like that? I mean, what kind of person do you have to be? I would say compassionate, um, being non-judgmental, having an open mind, and being willing to help, um, and having a passion for this type of work is really beneficial for this career because, I mean, like you said, we deal with a lot of things on a day-to-day -day basis, so also just being strong-minded as well and also being in tune with our own emotions, our own self-care, and being sure, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves. And so really, those are really the biggest aspects of who we look for and who we want in our program is really just being a good person overall. Yeah, and I think it also helps, too, whenever you've been in those situations or whenever you had a friend or a family member that has experienced either domestic violence or sexual assault, um, just because you have a different sort of compassion because you know what it's like to be in that situation um, and to try to figure out what you're supposed to do next. Um, I think it's just a different sort of compassion there as well. When... <clears throat> Uh, a victim kind of gets to you. I mean, this is, I would assume that they would talk to a counselor first and then be referred to you. Uh, what is it that you want to share with them at that point? Like, what should they do or what advice or information is important to get out there to them? I just let them know that everything is completely voluntary and that if we suggest something, we suggest a resource or something that we believe they need to do next, that it's completely up to them. They can tell us no. We're not going to force them to do anything. Just let them know that we're just there to support them in any decision that they make, um, that we're going to be there, non-judgmental, um, just, just let them know that we're there for them and that anything that they, they need, we'll try to do our best to make it happen or figure out another resource that can. Do you guys help underage victims? Yes, we have a child. Um, yes, we have a child sexual a assault sexual advocate. <coughs> yes, we do. And she um, takes on a lot of our child sexual assault cases and works with the families and the victims. Okay, and uh, how about male victims? Do you guys deal with male victims a lot? Yes, we help, um, we help everyone. We help females, males, um, regardless of their sexual orientation as well, um, regardless of race. We help everyone. It's wonderful. In the last couple of minutes we have here, um, if someone wanted to uh, get more information or avail themselves of your services, um, how do they get in touch with you? Um, you can reach us at our main line, which is 918-732-7979, and you'll be connected to our office. Okay, any last uh, parting words of advice for uh, potential victims who may be listening? What would you, what word of advice would you want to leave with? Um, just that you are, you are not alone. Um, there are people that care about you. Um, we care. Um, if you think that you don't have anyone to talk to, you're more than welcome to give us a call at the 732-7979 um, number. All of our services are completely confidential, so if you don't want to reveal your name at the time, that's fine. If you just want resources or just to see in what we offer, um, we can provide you that information as well. Any last thoughts, Michaela? Yeah, just a special reminder that we'll be having our honor walk on May 5th from 2 to 3 at the mound. And we will have free t-shirt or we'll have t-shirts available while the supplies last. Um, it is a community awareness event, so you don't have to register or anything like that. And we just highly encourage the community to come together and support this event and to recognize those victims of MMIP as well as support those families. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you uh, to the both of you for coming down and talking and 
uh, sharing <laughs> some of this information. I know it sometimes it gets a little hard to, to talk about it, and here we are putting it on the radio. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I hope that uh, folks will uh, take advantage of uh, the kind of help that you have to offer and come down and, and uh, avail themselves and see how life can go. Mm -hmm. All right, we want to thank, um, thank them for coming in. Uh, we appreciate it. We're going to take a short pause here. Then we're going to uh, be sharing some uh, information on a new language program at the College of the Muscogee Nation. So please stay with us here on uh, Muscogee Radio. Who am I? Am I Indian? Just because I'm a girl from the res, don't make things up about me. What if I move away? Then who am I? Some kids try meth just to escape, but then I think about my grandma, my little brother, my beadwork, my poetry, and I think I like who I am, and I know meth is not for me. Check out NCAI.org, a message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Who am I? Am I native? I don't want people assuming things because I'm Indian. I just want to be me, but how do I live in two worlds? Some guys just check out by doing meth. But that ain't for me, cause I see my family, my friends, my drum making, my future. There are a lot of cool things about being who I am, and meth isn't one of them. Learn more at NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. We have a uh, wonderful piece that we're being uh, share, this shared by our, our co-worker, uh, Jared Moore, who does Muskogee, Muskogee Vision on his deep dive program, he spoke with the, uh, some of the staff at, uh, at the college about a new uh, grant and a new language program that they've uh, just uh, uh, been uh, awarded and uh, how it will be offered to Muskogee citizens. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of LiveWire. I am your host, Jared Moore, and on today's program, we're going to be having Dr. Monty Randall. He is the president of the College of the Muscogee Nation. Thanks for being on today, Dr. Randall. But, oh, I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to be talking about a pretty huge grant that you guys got from the Mellon Foundation is $2.4 million, and I think that's split between the College of the Muscogee Nation and Emory College. Is that correct? That is correct. So uh, I guess to start off, what is the grant and what is it for and how's it going to be used? If you could just kind of go through all of that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually, so the um, Emory University was, is the grant recipient from the Mellon Foundation. And so, you know, this, uh, this partnership, this relationship with Emory University and the Muscogee Creek Nation and the College of the Muscogee Nation, it, it's been developing for the past two years. And it actually, it actually kind of started with uh, whenever I was over at the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation as the Secretary of Education and Training. So um, one of the um, um, admissions officers for uh, Emory University, um, Beth Michelle, she is a, a Native American um, tribal member. I believe she's a Tohono O'odham uh, tribe tribal member, and she works out at Emory University. And so she had reached out to us way back then in about 2020 to as Emory was developing their land acknowledgement and so they wanted to get a little bit more information on the Muscogee people and they also wanted to incorporate uh, the Muscogee language so not just about land acknowledgement but about uh, learning the history and, and building a relationship and so uh, this relationship um, just continued to, to be cultivated over the years and then as I came back over to the College of Muscogee Nation, we continued that that relationship and that partnership, and then um, we we came up with this idea on uh, how to further this partnership and solidify it, you know, through this grant proposal uh, to the Mellon Foundation, and um, you know, we we proposed uh, a couple of things. So for us, for the College of the Muscogee Nation. 
you know, we're working on the Muscogee language revitalization efforts. And so we had proposed a master apprentice style of teaching our Muscogee language certificate program. And so that's what um, our portion of the grant is going to go towards um, developing that master apprentice program. And then Emory has their priorities set for the things that they want to establish through it. So 2.4 million from the Mellon Foundation, and it's basically um, divided in half. So we get 1.2 million of that. Wow, that's amazing. So, so the master and apprentice system that you mentioned, you know, could you kind of uh, outline what's the difference between that and the classes that we that the college teaches now, just to give people an idea? Uh, you know, essentially, it, it's. It's an immersion method. It's an immersion style of, of teaching the language. And, and you know, it. I, I know we've talked a lot about um, with our, our efforts of revitalizing the Muscogee language. And, and, you know, many people we've talked about getting to the point where we can have an immersion school. And, you know, the, and, and so, you know, with immersion... You know, it, it, it's about, you know, just speaking the target language. So so speaking and, and nothing but Muscogee language in, in all things. And, and so an immersion school, we're, we're most likely talking about the K through 12 school system. And, and I think that's what most people, whenever we refer to that, when we say we want immersion school, that's what we're referring to. Mm-hmm. But immersion is, is, is a lot of things. It's, it's a method. And so we're taking this master apprentice. And so what we're going to do is we're going to alter the, uh, the, the course delivery, the program delivery of this 21 credit hour program, uh, the certificate, the Muscogee language certificate program. So there are uh, seven classes. So there are three credit hour classes. And there's 21 credits, so there's seven classes. And what I'm gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide those up. So three in the fall, three in the spring, and then that last one in, in the summer. And right now our, our our terms are 15 weeks. And so what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do is take those those three classes and just 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 adjust them just adjust how we how we teach so instead or how we deliver so typically you know you spread it across the 15 weeks and you may have a a class on monday and wednesday from you know 2 to 3 30 or you know whatever it is and then you take your class twice a week for an hour and a half and then that's it you know for that week so what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to compress those class periods and then so one class will be Monday through Thursday basically eight to five so I'm going to try to try to immerse those students in the language for those 15 weeks so Monday through Friday for 15 weeks I see eight eight to eight to five is going to be their their master apprentice um, environment so, so are these classes going to be something that only college students can take? Is it going to be open to the public, or how's that going to work? Nope. They're they're going to need to be college. They're going to need to be College of the Muscogee Nation students. Okay. So, so that's part of the that's part of the grant. That's part of the um, what we're going to do. So, our our portion of this of this grant is going to allow us to bring on two two new or two additional master teachers. And so ideally I want them to be first language speakers of the first language Muscogee speakers or highly proficient or fluent Muscogee language speakers. And then we're going to assist them with the, with curriculum and kind of, you know, the, 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 you know, the administration portion of, of, of a class, you know, of a college class, you know, the D2L and syllabus and all those kind of things, assessments, you know, we're going to help them with that. Um, and then, so, so starting this fall, 23, 
we'll have two cohorts of this master apprentice. So we're going to have one master and four apprentices combined. So, so that's going to be the, that's going to be the class. Okay. And, and so the, the apprentices, the students, they're going to have to go through admissions. They're going to have to, um, you know, and, and just, just regular admissions as they're a college of the Muscogee nation student seeking the Muscogee language certificate program. And, and they'll be, and with that, they'll be eligible for college of Muscogee nation scholarships, the Muscogee higher ed scholarships, the American Indian college fund, um, federal financial aid, all of right. that. Well, and I should mention but, too, while we're talking about this, if you're watching this and you want to get into this program or you're interested in this, the link to the college's website is in the description of this video. So you can go down there, shoot over there. You can look at the curriculums, this faculty, the staff and everything on there. So, and, and I think you guys also start the enrollment process through there too. Is that correct? That's right. That's okay. Right. Well, yeah. and, and also I wanted to say, um, We've had some questions pop up here in the chat, and I wanted to get to them because uh, the the person asked him, T.Y. Parole, he's a, a viewer that we have, tunes into every live stream. The, his first thing he says is, um, He's Che, I wish you were chief. Please consider running again. So <laughs> that's the first thing he says there. And then um, he, he has a question. He says, could we work on also getting some cultural and historical certification classes? So there's a way to make sure people who work circles representing us do it correctly. There's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding of Muskogee out there being peddled. Anybody representing the Muscogee Nation should at least have a level of cultural and historical competency comparable to that of kids participating in a Challenge Bowl. What is your opinion on that? And is that something we might see at the college level at the College of Muscogee Nation? A certification. Well, you know, certifications, you, you know, we, we offer four uh, certifications right now. Uh, Muscogee language, Muscogee language teaching, gaming, and a tribal leadership. Um, you know, to say that those are easier, you know, for us to to create, uh, you know, it, it, it is somewhat and um, we'll, we'll definitely take that into consideration. It does it does take a little bit of time. It does take a little bit of effort uh, to get these accredited, uh, you know, in, whether it's a degree program or a certificate to get it accredited right. through the Higher Learning Commission. So. Uh, definitely will take that into consideration. Um, you know, these certificates are a little bit uh, fast tracked, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, to get up to get them to that point. But, um, you know, definitely uh, I, I appreciate that. That's that's our mission is to encourage uh, native values, culture, language and self-determination. So yeah, we're absolutely. definitely. And, and, you know, I feel that a YouTube comment today from an individual who is in Georgia and they're not Native American. But one of the things they were asking me is because we have on our YouTube channel the um, language classes that the language department of the Creek Nation did uh, via Zoom during the pandemic, right? And so they were mm -hmm. watching that. And the lady, the person was asking me, is this appropriate? Is it okay for me to learn a language? I'm not going to offend anybody, et cetera, et cetera. Is, does the college offer anything for people who maybe they aren't um, students, college students, but they, but like language classes that just individuals can take? Or is there anything on, like that uh, uh, currently planned or anything like that in relation to this? Not, not necessarily. I mean, uh, you know, we usually, um, we, we offer some experiences, some programs, you know, for the campus, you know, so you don't necessarily have to be enrolled in that class, but most everything is geared towards um, the students and, and the campus. Uh, you know, we're, we're open to the public and, uh, you know, uh, we welcome anyone to come on and, 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 you know, take part in the activities that we have, but, uh, you know, we, we have, have a pretty full schedule of, of maintaining our classes right, and right. the activities. And yeah, so let me get, get, Oh yeah, go, can, yeah, can, go, go, go let for me, it. Let me, let me finish one thing, one final thought on, on that master apprentice program Yes. Uh, as part of that, that funding that we received. So part of it, like I said, is to bring on two new full-time faculty members who are going to be, uh, 
potentially elders who are first language speakers. And, and again, um, you know, to to speak the language, that's a different type of, you know, uh, teaching method that, that we're that we're trying to get to is, you know, trying to get away from teaching it through text um, and, and really immersing somebody in the spoken language. Um, so so that's one of the priorities of this master apprentice. And that's what some of the funding is going to go to. And the and then the other portion of the funding, like I said, so so four students in a cohort and I'm going to have two cohorts going in the fall. So so eight students. So they're going to be regular um, College of Muskogee Nation students are going to go through all the admissions and all of that. Now, mm-hmm. what's going to what's what's going to make it more selective is we're going to we're going to create a fellowship from that melon funding and we're, we're going to provide each student with an additional twenty five thousand dollars for that academic year to be a full time language learner. And this is what the, this is what we've always been talking about through the nation and through all of these, these, this language, the focus groups, the, the surveys that, that um, Chief Hill and, and, and the administration has been doing over the, well, we've been collecting data. And this is what the data, this is what the people have told us is mm-hmm. that one, we should, we should pay our first language speakers. We should pay them for, for their services. And we should also pay, pay language learners to learn this language. And that's essentially what we're going to do. And they talked about wanting an immersion and this is going to be immersion. It's going to, we're going to, we're going to help supplement um, students. So that way they can devote the time to this language learning. And, and so um, eight students, we're going to select them. We're going to create a, a, an application and we'll have that probably early summer so if anybody's interested, if you're wanting to, if you have the time and the desire and you want to come and be an apprentice and just come and learn the language, then that's who we're, we're looking for. People who have that desire, capacity, willingness to not only learn the language, I mean, we want you to do that, but then I'm, I'm going to need you to, to, to also want to be a teacher. So we're going to, so once this is all like a cycle of things, we need to, we need to create speakers and then we need to turn them into language teachers. I see. Uh, yeah. So, so that's the plan for the master apprentices. You go through the apprentice program, then you're the a master and then you start your own core cohort, right? Well, may, maybe not, a, maybe not a master. I wouldn't um, eventually maybe down the road. Okay. Uh, what I what I hope to do from this master apprentice program is to increase these these apprentices to increase their um, language proficiency level significantly over one academic year and get them to about a, a good solid mid range of proficiency and then and then bring them into a teacher a language teacher prep program and so we have that at, at the college of muskogee nation muskogee language teaching certificate and you know it, it's it, it it needs it needs some help i mean we're and we're going to and that's what i hope to do is bring these bring these students in and let let's let's redesign that let's gear that up and, and let's really focus on um, creating speakers, moving them into a teacher prep program, and then let's start, let's start disseminating more speakers and teachers out to the communities, to the JOM public schools, to, um, you know, wherever they're needed, uh, throughout the nation, uh, homes, you know, and, and, um, you know, and then eventually to create that K through 12 immersion school for our children. I see. Uh, so we've had some questions pop up here. I'm going to kind of synthesize them into two questions. The first one is these are in-person classes only, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the second one is, is kind of what you were talking about with the K-12. Is there going to be in, in this program, is there going to be anything that's like a requirement to get teacher certification or anything like that for any individuals that go through the program so that they can go into the public schools? Well, there's a, there's a couple of parts to that, you know, this will definitely help 
that person. Um, you know, ideally, I, I want, I, I would like for these, all, all that are going through this cohort to want to become language teachers. So, so one, yes, I want you to have the desire to learn the language and the willingness and the, and the capacity, but then I also would like for those to, to want to be teachers as well. Okay. Well, um, so we've established the amount of funding and how the program is going to work. Is there anything else on this program that we haven't talked about? That is there going to be like new facilities? Is this going to affect any of the other uh, parts of the college or the degree programs? Or is this going to and is this going to be a whole separate degree program? Or is it going to be part of another program? So it's actually so the master apprentice will will probably just stay with that certificate program. Okay. Okay. So, so what, and, and that's, so the, the language portion of it, you know, the 21 credit hours that are kind of pulled out of the associate degree. So a person, you know, could, you know, take the certificate program, 21 credit hours, and then say, Oh, you know, I want to continue on for an associate's degree. Mm -hmm. Then they'll have 21 credit hours towards the 60 credit hours for an associate degree. So that's already kind of built in there. Already. Okay. Um, and the same thing with the teaching certificate, you know, the Muscogee language teaching certificate. It's uh, I think that's a, a 24 credit hour program, but the same thing, those would all apply towards an associate degree in the native American studies at, at the college of Muscogee nation. So um, now there, there are a, a, some plans for development right now. So we, we're actually working on our third building on the uh, master site plan that's going up right now. That's the exhibit hall, lecture hall. And so that has a, a STEM classroom and, and two other additional classrooms. But the one of the biggest features is going to be the uh, 450 person seating capacity auditorium wow. that's in there. So that's one of the biggest features of it. And we're looking at, uh, we're, we're looking at um, gearing up for uh, a higher student enrollment. So we're actually looking at um, uh, building a uh, pre-engineered building on the north end of our campus just to add more classrooms and, and uh, office space. And then we're looking student center to increase our dining facility. And then the, and then the, the largest um, new portion of the expansion will be our fourth building on our master site plan. So that's not even designed yet. That's, that's you. coming that, that, that'll actually, we've, we've got the funding secured for that, uh, or a good portion of it. Um, but that building will increase our library on campus. And so that fourth building is going to be a Muscogee Memorial hall, and it's going to be dedicated to the Muscogee language It's going to be dedicated to, uh, moving our Native American studies from an associate degree to a bachelor's degree. And, uh, you know, that's on, that's on the five-year uh, strategic plan for us. And so with that, that's going to bring along that Muscogee language studies, that teacher prep program. And so, and so that right there is going to help us to be able to put certified teachers out into the public schools and, um, you know, really, really increase our, our Muscogee language uh, teaching and learning incredibly. Awesome. Well, I want to remind the viewers, if you guys got any questions, now's the time to pop it in there because we're getting close to wrap time. Um, apart from the language program and the stuff we've been talking about with the grant, is there anything like what, big things coming up for the college in the summer or the fall? Is there going to be any new classes? Is there going to be any new types of events that you guys are going to have? We actually have an event coming up on, uh, I believe it's uh, 1st of April, I believe April 6th, and we're going to be over at the uh, Claude Cox Omniplex, so we're going to have a um, uh, culture is prevention, um, um, behavioral health kind of um, awareness program, and so we're going to have uh, Stin Jotty come in, and he's going to awesome. be a guest speaker, and he's going to give a concert later on, so it'll be kind of a mini conference. And, um, you know, have vendors, I think they're bringing in food trucks and have a concert. So that's the next biggest thing that we've got coming up. Um, and then actually, uh, 
Uh, one other, we're, we're next week, uh, before then, uh, actually, we're taking our basketball team to the AHEC Student Basketball Tournament in uh, Newtown, uh, North Dakota. Wow. So that's, that's really, really a trip. That's going to yeah, we're going to, we're going to live stream those, those games. So oh, yeah. if, 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 if you want to see them, you know, follow us on, on Facebook, Instagram, um, I should LinkedIn, mention, Twitter, we're everywhere <clears throat> right now. So we're, I should mention for the audience too, the college of Muskogee nation has a YouTube channel. You can go there and you can subscribe to YouTube. I don't know if you guys are going to stream the games there. Is it going to be Facebook only, or is it going to be on YouTube too? Uh, I'm not sure on that. Yeah, you're not the, the, well, the IT uh, guy, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get it out there, though. We'll All get right, it out so, there for so, sure. so check that out. And um, with that Stin Jotty event, um, is this going to be something where people can just walk in? Or are there going to be tickets or anything like that? It, it, it's completely free. It's completely open to the public. It'll be over there where uh, the, the festival concerts usually take place and uh, just – uh, three o'clock i think registration opens and come on over everybody's welcome yep you know, come, and, come enjoy the show and that's the claude cox omniplex in Oatmulgee, everybody if you if you don't know where the claude cox omniplex is it's oklahoma Oatmulgee, oklahoma because i know how we have and, and viewers all over so and we're really we're really wanting to reach out to our alumni so okay. see them in alumni come out wear your gear um you know come over swing by the um you know, the student center, the, the bookstore, the Raven's Nest bookstore, pick up some new gear. We've got new logos. We've got mascot. We've got all kinds of apparel for you. Absolutely. And it's cool looking stuff too, guys. So you should go check it out. Uh, well, with that being said, we're about close to the wrap time. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think is important to mention about this grant or anything else with the college? You know, with, with this grant, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the Mellon Foundation, you know, believes in, uh, in in the work that we're doing at the College of the Muscogee Nation. They believe in the re this revitalization efforts, you know, so much that they funded this this effort, this amazing effort. Uh, this this is a model. This is the first time we've ever seen this type of of research institution, Emory University, and a tribal college. You know, they are in our homelands, and they've reached out to us. They've partnered with us. And, and, you know, they're working to, to create an indigenous studies minor on their campus. And they've reached out to us and they want our help uh, to learn the language, to uh, learn about the, the issues of sovereignty that, uh, that we teach on our campus. And they want to replicate that on their campus. So um, this is, this is a, not just the grant, but this whole relationship. This, this is huge and this is going to be a model for other institutions and other tribal colleges um, and other minority serving institutions across the United States. Absolutely. And uh, I want to tell you, you're doing a great job. And I also want to mention that that's been a comment that we've received several times in the chat is that you guys are doing a great job at the college and keep up the good work. So with that being said um, to everybody, I don't have uh, any live wires scheduled in the future. I'm trying to get some stuff scheduled. We're going to have some more videos posted on our YouTube channel, so just keep tuning in, and uh, we'll, I guess we'll uh, catch you guys next time. Thanks for coming on. I do. Appreciate it. Okay. Once again, we want to thank Jared Moore for uh, loaning us that piece, and we keep trying to get uh, Stenjati on uh, this show, so we're going to try and make it an event at some point. We got a few announcements we're going to zip through real quick in the last couple of minutes. First of all, let me remind everyone that we're calling for graduate profiles for the Muskogee News. If you want your uh, graduation notice and photo uh, in the paper for our special June 1st edition of the Muskogee Nation News, Muskogee News, please uh, get it in. Give us a call at 732-7720 or get a hold of us there at our office. The deadline is May the 12th at 5 p.m., and late profiles will not be accepted. All right. Um, the feud distribution has expanded its jurisdiction to include Muskogee and Broken Arrow, uh, and so I wrote a story on that, and you can refer to that story for more information. Um, you can find it on our website or call 918-549-2401. That is the MCN food distribution location here in Altmulgee for more information on how to um, become a participant living in those areas. 
Uh, here's a reminder, the Higher Education Department would like to invite graduating post-secondary students to apply for their graduation stowal program. That is that beautiful um, um, red and white fabric stole that drapes over your shoulders and covers your graduation cap and gown. Uh, to apply, get a hold of a higher education grant advisor or call 732-7661. April 29th, this Saturday from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., the Tulsa Creek Indian Community Spring Fling Arts and Crafts Sale is seeking vendors. Okay, everybody looks like we're being cut off here. Mado. Mado. You've been listening to Muskogee Radio. Join us again next week for more local, tribal, and community news and updates. Mado. Mado.